today. And today we've got uh, Dr. Karen Cronin and Virginia Baker here, of course. Um, Karen comes from a policy and um, social science background. She's currently working for Landcare Research, looking after the policy and governance group. Previously worked with uh, ESR and has held other roles in urban. In right. So um, Karen's research interest is uh, in the area of science, technology and society, so that nexus of how things interact. And I think it's uh, particularly important. I, one of the previous roles was in uh, uh, GM work in Cotton Food, and this was something that we were starting to think about, and the program that Karen's going to talk about came out of some of the discussions that Cotton Food had about the social acceptability of GM. So the title today is The Use of Social and Market Intelligence to Enhance the Impact of Investment and Future Food Technologies. And with that, thank you for Karen. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Kia ora. Um, thank you very much to the Ministry for inviting us to speak today. and. Um, pleased that we're talking to people in Wellington and in other sites, so um, Morena, good morning to everybody. Um, I'm here with my colleague Jimmy Baker from ESR, and we're presenting the results of an applied piece of social science, which we think has a very strong connection with innovation and with um, markets and our, our export um, process as a country. Um, what we're going to do today uh, is first of all acknowledge uh, the foundation of forced funding that we received for this contract in 2008. Um, we've had um, a four-year project which we're just concluding. Uh, we're presenting um, phases one to three of this project today and phase four is just being wrapped up. Uh, but it has been a collaboration with Plant and Food Research, Federal ESR, um, some subcontracts with uh, New Zealand Council for Education Research, um, Hull University Business School, um, Professor Lynn Frewer and colleagues from the University of Wageningen New Zealand consultant Barbara Nicholas, and a number of uh, senior researchers have been part of our advisory panel. Um, the other person on the advisory panel there, whose name should be mentioned, is Ian Ferguson, who's now moved from Plant and Food and is part time at the MPI. Uh, what I want to do today is introduce this research project to you, uh, and it's about stakeholder dialogue. It's called Coming to the Table, so it's about bringing stakeholders around the table for dialogue and then thinking about how dialogue and those discussions can be used more effectively in strategy. Uh, we want to tell you what we've found about social and market preferences for foods, but we think that these findings are very relevant to investment in other areas of technology, because it's about reading that social context and market context uh, in which uh, our investment decisions are made. So we think there are implications uh, for future policy and strategy, uh, and we have a number of questions that we've responded to in this project, but we think there's some even more exciting questions that are now sitting there for us to pay attention to. And at the end, we'd really be keen to talk with you about what you see as the coming questions and the uh, issues that need to be taken forward. Uh, we've got an hour and a half today, and um, I've asked Jimmy and Steve to keep an eye on our time. <laughs> what we propose to do is present our results to you um, and then we'll take a break at various points. If there's a really burning question, um, we might flag that, um, but we are primarily going to have a discussion at the end, and we've built that into our timeline. Uh, but we will have to go through at a reasonable clip. So um, you have to, we'll, we'll go, we'll present material to you, we'll talk to aspects of it, and then we will um, have that question time at the end. So this project is a collaboration between biophysical scientists and social scientists. It came about because scientists at Plant and Food, who had some experiences, shall we say, about how their science was received uh, by the operating environment, were saying, when we invest in the next round, and at that point it was, where do we go to with biotech? Or how might we pitch our investment uh, programs in relation to nanotech and functional foods? How do we make those decisions, bearing in mind the feedback that we've had on what we've done to date? How can we make a better judgment about that context and so those scientists came to the social science team at ESR and we created this joint project. It's been running for four years and we're presenting um, up to phase three, um, the stakeholder dialogue and the international literature reviews and so on today. 
So what this project has about, been about, first of all, is that there's a futures component. What are the trends coming up in those key areas of science? How can we engage those different stakeholders in a dialogue process about those trends and issues? And out of that, we're saying, what can we establish are the risk uh, acceptance or risk aversion characteristics that seem to attach to certain technologies? So rather than simply describing risk perceptions, and there have been a lot of studies that did that, this person likes this and that person likes that, what is the reason behind people's statements when they express risk acceptance or aversion? And what does that mean for the characteristics of technologies that we might invest in? That has big implications for strategy and investment. And so we're offering a process here where understanding those uh, situations, understanding those values, can provide new intelligence for decisions. So the notion behind this is uh, presented in this model. Um, if we think of this as a system, uh, the white space around is the whole biophysical environment that we all live in. Uh, in this model, society is seen as a subset of the biophysical environment, and the economy is a subset of society. Now, if we think about science um, as in the classic pipeline idea, the yellow box in the middle, um, decisions are made at the top. What will we invest in? Where are we heading with our science and investment? And that then feeds into the science innovation pipeline. So theoretical work, laboratory work, and applied technology is then funded and explored and developed. Some of that, obviously, will become um, applicable, become commercially usable, and it will find its way as products into the market. Now, finally, when those things come out of the science system and hit the public awareness, they hit the supermarket shelf, or in some cases, they hit the front page of a newspaper, there is suddenly some awareness about it in society. So it's very often downstream in the innovation process that the uh, outcomes of science have that impact. And often when we've had controversies, it's only at that very downstream moment that we do engagement. We think, oh, well, why are people saying that, or how can we talk about it? All the literature internationally is saying that we need to engage earlier. We need a more uh, innovative approach so that further up in that decision cycle, we can engage and understand those contextual values so that we feed that into our process. So this project was, I think, one of the first in the world to be an applied uh, project with biophysical scientists, real-world decision makers, trialling out an upstream process and using it uh, based on the principles of dialogue between stakeholders. So we had a process uh, that was following this research cycle. If you start at the top, if we're thinking about investing in future food technologies, we knew the current situation uh, was that there were real signals of market resistance and social aversion to some technologies, not all but some. So we did first of all a big study of New Zealand and international literature so we could say what's our baseline knowledge now, what do we know about that, what are the trends in the science and what are the new trends and how to engage with stakeholders. And out of that futuring work we pulled out 25 indicator technologies across those four domains of science that we thought were representative of the characteristics of those technologies, and we tested that in a dialogue process called Issues Mapping. So I'll tell you about the detail involved face-to-face -face interviews and workshops. The point of doing that was, again, not simply to describe perceptions, which is all very well, but to see whether we could find common ground between very diverse perceptions, and if we could understand why people were either happy with something or expressing aversion, and what that might mean for the attributes of technology. So it was taking the cream off the top of that dialogue discussion to inform strategy. So we are now moving up to the top of the cycle. We're working with end users, some of the senior people in one of our major science institutes and um, a senior level of management um, in the private company, working with Plant and Food and Zespri to feed those results back into the strategy process. And we hope that that will add further information for our future innovation. So what do we know about social and market preferences? Um, what do we know from the international and New Zealand literature? Uh, Ginny's now going to present that to you. I thought you were going to do that. I'll do the international one, okay. Right. Sorry. See, we've got a good team back here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the li international literature, just quickly, we know from all of the studies that have been done internationally and through our work with the University of Wageningen, the Food and Consumer Marketing Group, that social and political values and cultural values are really essential if we want to understand consumer responses. 
So there is a social context to what happens in the market. In this area of novel technologies, we know that in the ideas about sustainability, about nature, about choice and trust, feature over and over again in the literature on why people say what they say, why we get those, those social responses. They influence new technologies. Depending on the purpose and the risk and benefits, um, and whether those risks might be seen as health risks, um, whether the benefits might be seen as individual social benefits, this interplay between perceived risks and benefits is absolutely critical to understanding what's going on when technologies are introduced. But to, to this point, we've had some bits of that puzzle studied, um, but not all. If we go into the particular agri-tech applications, across the world, opposition to GMOs is very well documented, and we're suggesting from the literature and indeed in our own study that that pattern of concern about GM affects other technologies that might be coming on stream. So we refer to that as the shadow of the GM debate. Ethical issues are very important. The literature says there's a strong focus on issues around food quality, safety, nutrition, and social attributes, um, fair trade and sustainability. Some areas are not as well studied as others, and there is more work needed in bio, nano, and um, some of the personalised nutrition work. So if we look at that international literature, we know that if there are negative uh, public responses to technologies, uh, that is going to create the scene. That's going to create the context in which new technologies are going to be commercialised or an attempt to commercialise them. We know that consumers are becoming more selective. They're conscious not just of the product, but the process behind it. So the notion of provenance. What's the storyline? Where's the integrity and the whole purpose of why you set out to make this food or this technology? That becomes part of the, uh, the social meaning that people make of a product. Uh, there is diversity across countries and we, uh, with our international colleagues, would like to do a lot more to understand what are the drivers in different countries. For New Zealand, I think it's really key we understand drivers in, in the Asian markets that are so crucial to our future. We'll say something more about that in the future. Um, there's not much published, at least in English, about Asian markets, so we have to work our context, social scientists like us, in these other countries uh, to get further information about. So I'm now going to turn to Jay, <laughs> who will talk about the New Zealand literature review and what we found there. Okay, Jay. Kia ora, Kase. Thank you, Kia. This is an area that I know much better because this is the part that I was actually involved in. Um, yeah, very much so. So we, um, it's sort of, we'll walk you through it, sort of repeating, I think, what has come up in the international literature and what's really strong about the study is the different points of triangulation throughout the study that we had. So for this one, we looked at 138 um, different publications. We did this in 2009. We went right back to 1990. So I think this is one of the more comprehensive reviews that we have around the New Zealand literature on, on these types of issues. Um, how did the New Zealand public feel about emerging food technologies? Pre-1999, um, no surprises. There was fairly low awareness and no strong aversion to, to GE. For the Royal Commission, we had 90% of people um, strong and it's not a surprise given the mode of um, consultation there. Um, some of the other surveys gave us sort of I suppose a more accurate um, view of how the general population is feeling about things. An Eros survey through Lincoln University, over 50% of respondents consumed that variety. And consumer bases, um, one in particular found that 41% of household shoppers wouldn't choose to have even if they were free. So the literature review in New Zealand was telling us that there was a fairly strong aversion to DEM food and that it might possibly be difficult to shift. Um, there were some people, particularly from the more consumer-based studies, who were asking, well, is there a growing middle ground here? You know, does it depend? And is there a sort of a softening of that aversion based stance? Um, we would sort of, yeah, we would, in, we were the authors that would view that quite cautiously and emphasise that public opinion does seem to be quite volatile in the sense that something can spark quite an aversive um, reaction. Um, we felt that acceptance and that whole thing of it depends, depends on a mix of contingent and traditional factors, which came up in that international literature review as well. But particularly in New Zealand, there was quite a strong interlocking relationship between two sets of values, one being nature having an intrinsic value, and the other being post-materialist value sets, notions of democracy, citizenship, anti-materialism, and in fact cynicism towards capitalism. So that's what some of the views are sitting in. Um, 
<coughs> and we further sort of thought unpacking it depends. Um, it was sort of more clear that it was coming from those that were probably quite opposed to GED type foods, but they would consider a particular application that may have particular benefit to them or a sector of the population that they had an affinity with. So again, just being it's quite cautious, the softening that, that we might be thinking this year. Um, who's been with your studies? Consumers, um, household shoppers, these are, this is just a short and through the literature in terms of what was actually looked at. Mothers, mostly, mostly affluent consumers were looked at in those studies. Um, the public, the scope of that was expanding. Initially it was just professionals and teachers and then there was more of a, a view of engaging the public with those surveys. And there was a significant number of dedicated studies with farmers, scientists and Māori. Um, the viewpoints of Pacific and other cultural groups were underexplored and um, this project we did include Māori viewpoints and we made an effort to include Pacific viewpoints but that wasn't, um, yeah, I think there's probably more research that could be done in that area. Um, and just to summary, integrity of nature and brand was important. Um, women in Māori had quite distinct concerns and women in Māori definitely formed, um, tended to sit on that more oppositional side of, of the attitudes to GE. And that these responses were consistent with um, others. And I think this might be where I pass back to Karen and we'll have a time sheet. <laughs> so Karen's just briefly going to set up and then I'll jump that's a relief. <laughs> 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 to 10, 15, not quite. Um, so, uh, that's our uh, reasonably rapid run through what we found from the international literature and the New Zealand literature. So, that was our baseline. So, what we're doing in this project is zooming in and doing some in depth work with stakeholders in New Zealand. And we're bringing together a very carefully selected set of stakeholders people from industry who are actively involved in those different areas of food. Um, in marketing, production, sales and international contracts, uh, people who are from the science community, uh, from the laboratory bench through to marketing, strategy and management, people from community interest groups, uh, people who are interested in nutrition or consumer issues or the food movement or environmental movement or with um, other social concerns, and finally people with a background in government. And this, uh, this selection of people is very important to the method we used here. This is a qualitative study. There was no need to produce yet another public survey because there's already been you know, 20 years of that um, on the books. What we wanted to do was dig in and see well, why do people say what they say? And another thing we were doing was saying that this debate as it plays out in the public arena, there's often an assumption that well, if you're a scientist, you'll believe this. And if you're an NGO, you will automatically believe that. And these positions are very fixed and very black and white, and never the twain shall meet. And we were asking ourselves, well, how strongly are those positions held? Uh, does there have to be uh, an entrenched and intractable debate? Can people come together and find common ground? So we were scrupulous about selecting people who were representative of those broad range of interests from our database, and we had about 400 of us people in our database as we brought up the project. So we selected from that database a very representative sample of people to do qualitative research. Face-to-face -face interviews with 39 people across the country, and then we pulled out of those interviews the data that they were presenting about their sense of the attributes of these technologies, and we turned those data into graphs. And then we used those graphs as a visual aid for a dialogue workshop. So I'm now going to present to you what happened in each of those three phases of the field. We had people from across those segments, as I say, at Christchurch, Wellington and Auckland. Uh, uh, after our review of this project uh, with Morst uh, in our second year, it was decided that uh, one of those segments uh, would be an all Māori group, so we had two general groups and one Māori group, and that, that uh, part of the field work is done here in Wellington. So, um, I'm now going to invite Jenny to say something um, about what we got from the interviews, uh, and we'll just uh, flag some of the key ideas that came out, and then we'll talk about what came through in the graphs when we put their data together and made these issues mapping graphs. Okay, so a key idea from this one is I think a, a sort of a, a difference between how scientists saw risky foods and how others saw risky foods. For scientists, um, they really felt that processed foods were safer than raw foods, and from a food safety perspective, things like 
where you've just had that outbreak of bean sprouts and E. coli. So people were mindful that fresh food was actually a little bit risky in terms of um, in terms of things. And um, yeah, just sort of showing there that scientists, some of the scientists that we talked to were also opposed to uh, to GM foods too. So that we we were sort of disrupting some stereotypes with this, I think, and that the scientists weren't necessarily all pro GE and the community wasn't necessarily all anti GE either. So it was, it was interesting. Um, from a more community perspective, um, perspective Back to nature, um, new foods were too complicated and expensive. Um, and also people becoming sort of hyper aware of food was another trend that people were noticing. Um, and that, that could encourage people to cut out on what, what beneficial foods there were. Dairy was a good example of that, where people sort of think about dairy allergies or wheat allergies and then cut those food groups out, but perhaps are not allergic sort of thing. So there was some talk about that. And again, white processed foods, um, really deadly foods, especially for Māori and Pacific Island communities. So that, that was um, the nature of how risk was being described by some groups. Beneficial foods, there's strong things across all our stakeholder groups, natural fresh fruit and vegetables, food production that supports health and social relationships. A lot of people mentioned it's not just about eating the food, it's about who you're eating the food with and where you're eating the food and those whole Nostalgia, I suppose, and the history building within families is really important. Um, as well as looking forward, I suppose, in terms of future generations and um, for Māori participants, particularly the Māori <coughs> being a more of an educational setting for passing on knowledge around food and good food preparation. And all these things that people were a little bit concerned with. Yeah, What's a local foray? Um, a local what is, is about the local, the food being purchased locally. So we see the trend of farmers markets, for instance. Um, that whole sort of recognising that homegrown is, is more nurturing, I think, was coming through in a lot of the, the conversations that we had in these interviews. It's also the food miles idea that's very apparent in the markets as well. Mm. <coughs> And there was some support for functional foods, but also concerns about ethics, accessibility, and that they're being only able to be bought by people with a lot of money versus people that perhaps had health conditions that would really benefit from some of these functional foods. And again, people were looking forward in terms of New Zealand keeping sort of meshes and combinations and preservation of real foods. Um, balancing that thing of food being convenient, but also preserving all the natural integrity of the food products was, was seen as an important um, and beneficial way to pursue. And I think this is where we go back to Kara. Okay. All right, so we've done our interviews. We've talked to people face to face and we've asked them these very open questions. What do you think what might be a risky food? What's a beneficial food? And already some themes have emerged. Um, now we're going to drill in and give them the uh, technology examples, the 25 examples that we selected. Um, and I'll just show you uh, what we did. Um, if we had more time, we would probably um, invite you to do this exercise here on the spot, because it can be quite fun. Um, we produced um, a number of flashcards uh, for our four technology domains. So we had eight examples in the biotech area. Um, we had another eight, uh, eight examples in nanotech, we had four examples in sustainable agriculture, uh, and we also had a series of examples in functional foods. So these cards uh, were given to people um, with um, a description on the front about the, if you like, the domain of science that it came from. This was one, one of our domains, functional foods. Then a subheading, nutrigenomics. Uh, and an exa this example is matching genetic risk factors for disease with food and diet. On the back of the card, is a general description of what that technology is about, what it's trying to do, what it involves, and then uh, in very neutral language, what are some of the issues and aims of doing that, that science, and what might be the alternatives you, if you're trying to achieve the same results. So these uh, flashcards were also available online a week before the interviews, and during the interviews people had time to read them, work with them literally on the table, um, and then we asked them to rank them. So we gave them this five point ranking scale, this is our very high-tech bit of technology. <laughs> we asked them to place those cards on the scale. Do you find this example either completely acceptable right through to completely unacceptable? We did this with individual people, and then we recorded what each individual said, 
and then we combine their results to create a whole picture. And that was really the essence of the method. When we look at those diverse range of people that were there, is there common ground? Or did all the scientists group their cards here <laughs> and all the community here? Um, and I won't spoil the punchline, um, but it wasn't as simple as we might have thought <coughs> if you just look at that black and white debate in the public domain. So here are the technology examples. I came out of our future scanning, we had those four technology domains, and we asked people two questions. How would you rank those examples? And we use the cards. But the second question, and I don't have the materials here, is a very important set of words. When you think about this whole question of future food technologies, what is at the heart of the matter for you? And it was very much about your personal views, because we were trying to dig into people's values. We weren't just doing a tick box. Why do people say what they say? What are the social values behind this? And we gave them 10 value statements, and we asked them to indicate on this conceptual circle diagram which of those values was the most important matter for them personally. It wasn't the official view of the organisation, it wasn't what they thought should be happening out there, but it was their own personal statement. Um, and we will present the results of, of that uh, to you in the next few minutes. So, let's give you what came out when we took the interview results and put them into some graphs. Now, in this uh, uh, combined graph, you can see that all the risk accepted rankings for all our participants have been summarised for each of those four technology domains. Um, you can see the colour coding at the bottom, at the very bottom. The darker the colour, the more acceptable. And sustainable agriculture is in that purple grey, functional foods blue, nanotech green and biotech in that orange and yellow. Now, if you cast your eye over those graphs, you can see a pattern um, of where there was either risk acceptance or risk aversion. Um, I'll go inside each of those technology domains in a minute. Um, but the overall result was a very clear pattern that um, sustainable agriculture and functional foods tended to attract less risk aversion and more acceptance than many of the applications in the nano and bio area. But if you go inside the biotech area, uh, we had a range of technologies there and there are different points of view depending on the application. So we were testing out, does the word biotech flip the reaction? Um, does the word sustainable flip the reaction? Or does it depend on the particular application and its use? That's what we were exploring. So if we go inside biotech, and then we sort it by those different segments that we sampled in our, in our qualitative interviews, you can see quite an interesting pattern emerging. Uh, the scientists and the government and the community and the industry participants give us a, a different profile on their ranges of acceptance. So within the science group, um, the overall pattern is a higher level of risk acceptance. The community uh, risk acceptance across all of those examples is, is lowest. We also found that some kinds of biotech were much more acceptable than others. So across the board, uh, the method of using marker-assisted selection and using that genetic theory and knowledge to assist with breeding um, was ranked pretty well by all of our segments. Uh, the example that across the board attracted the most aversion was to genetically modify a factory farm animal um, so that when it was in a cage or was being held in a factory farm situation, it couldn't feel pain. And this is a highly technical term, it's called the ick factor. And so we got a very clear reading from people that that technology example produced a high level of version. And there are a range of views um, across the segments, uh, depending on the nature of the example. Now, we don't have time today to go into all of these. Um, I, I might just pause, and Ginny can keep an eye on my time, and just see if you, if you see a pattern there, or whether there are any observations that you would make based on this qualitative sample of people that we've, we've brought forward from our fieldwork. Is there anything that occurs to you looking at that pattern there? I just have a question kept back in group self-selection yeah. of <coughs> how did you manage not just getting a group of people coming because they had quite strong views on oh, right. the technology? Yeah, no, we were very scrupulous about who we invited in, so we knew that across, if you like, it wasn't a survey of the public, like a phone survey, it was community interest groups. So, uh, as I said before, we have people who are involved in nutrition and health, um, people who might be uh, interested in um, the whole food movement, um, and restauranting and retailing, 
um, people from environmental groups and so on. So if you were to say what would be a good spread of community interest groups around the food area, uh, we had a database of over 400 people and individuals to choose from, and we, we built into that a very careful mix of people from those community interest groups. And the same applies to those other segments. It's scary the misalignment between government there's an interesting pattern there. And when we've presented these results in our workshops and to other end user groups, people have also noted the close link between the community pattern and the industry pattern. I wonder yeah. if that says something about um, access to information and visibility. So um, I do work with the food industry and what we see is that when you're talking about with individual companies, they see this much. Yes. They don't see this much because they're working in a, in a particular area. So the first thing that occurred to me in that is that both scientists and government probably have access to more information and are reading more stuff. So you get, that's why you would get a similar mm -hmm. thing between community and industry. Yeah. Well, I would support that. Because I've heard that like, other public debates, I've seen in the absence of any public debate on these issues at all. Mm -hmm. Well, what we're saying is that what manifests in the public arena um, as a result of media attention to controversy, and we're saying what actually sits behind that, and our proposition today is that that media controversy can flare up at any time, and indeed since we did this work there have been two or three quite substantive flare up stories in the last three or four months. So it depends on where we're reading and what we're measuring, uh, and our proposition today is that the quantitative studies show a pattern over time. We've done a drill down study into individuals, these were nearly two hour interviews with each person, half day workshops we're suggesting a pattern here of social responses that needs to be part of our reading of that environment. Karen, these um, people, the, your respondents or participants are all New Zealand based, are they? Yes, they are. Yeah. And that's a very good point, Mike, because we need to triangulate that with what we know about our market context. And as I said at the beginning, we're very keen to work with our counterparts in places like China and other places, places of Asia to get a better handle uh, on what's happening in those markets. So um, I'm not going to go through all the detailed uh, examples of each one, but they, they are in the report, and you can see uh, the full picture of these graphs on our website, uh, which we'll put the address up at the end. The nanotech uh, pattern is a bit more mixed. It's not such a pronounced change between those different segments uh, as we got in the biotech one. Functional foods moving more towards uh, uh, higher acceptance, in the functional foods area, we picked examples that were different kinds of categories. So the black currant example was saying, here are black currants, and our science tells us that there are these attributes that are made visible out by our scientific knowledge. Um, another approach is to uh, take uh, the raw goods, as it were, in terms of fruit and vegetables, and process them differently. That was the way of adding value. Um, the next one was to use genetic uh, theory and information to look at food characteristics to genetic traits and matching that with individual health risks. And the final one was adding something into the food. So we were testing out this idea, are there attributes around the food that science can demonstrate that adds value? Do you get value by adding something in? Do you get value by changing how they're processed? So we chose our examples to test out those attributes. Uh, in the sustainable agriculture area, um, the level of risk acceptance was uh, higher still. Uh, within this area, we had some high-tech examples like hyperspectral imaging um, and some which were not hard technologies at all. We had a verification program, which you like is, if you like is a knowledge-based tool. How, how might we add value to our exports uh, if there was a verification program that took account of the backstory of a product because it came from organic production and with the Māori um, spiritual platform behind how that organic um, was produced. So we had a mix then of hard and soft technologies and knowledge systems technologies. If you go back to that one, there's an I'd interesting like thing. <laughs> Scientists' highest ranking was hyperspectral imaging. Yeah. Community's lowest ranking was hyperspectral imaging. Yes. Is that simply a lack of understanding of what hyperspectral means, and therefore um, frightening people are frightened of it? We noticed that too. Um, 
I think that to some extent that might represent the idea of I'm more comfortable with soft technologies than um, high tech technologies. Um, but uh, the level of um, risk aversion, if you see the palest one, it's still very small. So there's a different level of acceptance between those groups. Um, but that's a good question for us to tease out. And one of our key findings in this project is the influence of words. <laughs> if you say hyperspectral imaging, or if you say organic, or if you say sustainable, or if you say GM, immediately a whole bundle of associations are made. And we had some quite fascinating moments during this project where people were trying to, if you like, game the situation by saying, well, we should use this word and then we'll get this result. Or if I said this word, then people would think differently. So as social scientists, we find that absolutely fascinating. Um, and we think that the, the, we need to understand better how those discourses and languaging and words are used to influence acceptance or not. We were trying to dig beneath that. So we were trying to say, okay, well, you might say it was biotech, but what kind of biotech? What was the purpose of it? What was the type of application? What was it trying to achieve? So digging deeper and deeper into the real purpose of what that technology is about, rather than being tripped up by words or labels. And we think that's a little bit about what's difficult in the normal public debates. Yeah, Karen, just before we go up that slide, the thing that also stands out is that um, industry um, and the public have a great aversion to um, chemical pesticides, and yet in the community they were quite suspicious of biological control. And yet the whole marketing focus of biological control is it's nice, it's natural, it's completely acceptable. But obviously the community doesn't see it that way. I wouldn't um, put it as firmly as that, Max. I think this is about relativities. So um, if we were mapping relativities of biological control um, against on-farm biodiversity, there's a bit of a difference there. But if we were to put the whole bundle of these sustainability applications against another class of applications, then we get a different picture. So as Ginny said at the beginning, it really depends. Um, and we can't say that uh, the community doesn't like biological control. This sample group, in comparison to those others, showed a pattern of aversion. So I guess we're putting um, a little bit of a, um, a warning around this data in the sense that we need to dig into some of it more. Uh, we need to see it as a pattern and it depends on the purpose of the end use. So there are, there are points of comparison and points of generalisation. Now, moving on to these value statements. Um, we had 10 statements that we drew out of what we knew and what we knew from our previous interviews. And uh, we, we know that when these debates unfold, if you ask what's driving it, someone might say, look, the whole point about this is that we've got to get more export growth um, and make sure that we um, use our food industry to achieve those results for New Zealand. Or someone might, someone might say ethical values. So this uh, methodology we used here was to try and dig into what were those values and framings that people were using that are part of their risk judgment, their risk assessment. Uh, and our proposition is that that framing is very influential on what we might notice popping up as a perception or a reaction. So we ask people to rank these in terms of how important is this to you personally? What's at the heart of the matter for you? And um, this is the summary of those uh, raw data results. People had that empty circle diagram, and they would put they put the individual statement cards in, in, the, in the middle or further up, depending. So where did each statement get put? Um, which, um, if you go to the bullseye in the centre, the most central issue, uh, the one that got the highest votes, as you were, as, as it were, in the centre, was ensuring that food is safe to eat. Across the board, that got the strongest centrality ranking from our participants. Um, and we thought, hmm, interesting, because it kind of fits the literature. <laughs> so we were doing that triangulation. The next highest ones in the centre were protecting the environment, human health, and then we start to move out sustainable agriculture and so on. So you can see the pattern. Um, if you just focus on the bullseye, that's a bit like first past the post voting. So it's interesting to see which got the biggest vote, as it were, in that central bullseye. But also look at the second circle out and the third circle out, and you can start to see a pattern there of the spread. So that's the raw data of how people did that ranking in their personal interviews with us. We put it together as this picture. Um, we then can present it in a different way. 
we can say, if you look at that innermost circle, which statement was placed there the most frequently? And in this graph, the bigger the box and the darker the color, uh, the stronger uh, that was um, as a statement and a central value for our participants. So you can see much more clearly what that pattern is. Food safety, environmental protection, moving in a bit of a spiral, human health and sustainability, and it, as it goes round, you can see the relative centrality that those value statements have for people. Uh, and, and so we have, if you like, a triangulation about what they said in their interviews and what they did with their ranking exercise. If we segment that out, uh, which did different groups rate as most central? And I know that someone who's at the back may not be able to see this, so please look at our report where you can see the graphs on the full page. Um, scientists, um, food safety, human health, making decisions based on scientific facts and environmental protection and sustainable agriculture were some of the bigger ones. Uh, government, food safety, environment, sustainable agriculture, human health and fair trade were some of the bigger ones. <laughs> it's interesting that government rank economic growth was last. Yes, well, <laughs> relatively. <laughs> relatively. <Yes. laughs> And I need to stress that no uh, one individual uh, in, our, in our sample uh, was uh, seen as representing the views or the official policy of their organisation or sector. These were very much personal views. But what we were trying to do was break down the, 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 the stereotype that you know, if you had a background in government, you would believe all this. If you had a background in science, you automatically believe that. That's what we were trying to prize over. Were um, CRI scientists counted as government or science? Science, yes. Good question. <laughs> I mean, you have to note that you didn't put, put enough food on the table to the world and say that. I mean, like Yes. Yes. But it wasn't one of the value statements that we, we chose to use, but it certainly was reflected in the interviews, and I think that would be a good one to use in further rendition of this, because it's starting to come through as part of that discourse. So I think that's a very fair point. Um, so no, not necessarily, because um, especially in the Wellington group, uh, there was a lot of reference in the interviews and the workshops to affordability. Mm -hmm. So this is a combination of the results across. So uh, we're quite confident with the range of people we had here, but we would need to put these results alongside other studies as well to have an even more robust picture. So we're adding to that knowledge So does that chart emphasise that the community as a whole is suspicious of science because it ranks making decisions based on scientific facts as, very, as the last? So it doesn't care about science? I don't think I'd go as far as to say it doesn't care about science, but it does reflect some other studies that have been done, and it reflects the international literature, where people are, are asking about what is the purpose of some science investment, and what's been said in the science policy world about license to operate. So there's a conversation there about the role of science, uh, and certainly during the peak of the GM debate, uh, internationally in New Zealand, there were questions around trust in science. Uh, our observation would be that those issues are still volatile, uh, and they come up and they attach themselves when these technology issues become a risk conflict. So we have to move on with time. So just to uh, finish this segment, we set out to say, if you look at these debates in the public domain, there's a very recognisable positioning of what looks like an entrenched view. Uh, our hypothesis was that those stereotypes don't always hold true, and we found that. Within scientists or in the community, we found a mix of views, depending on the nature of the application. We think that words and people's identity, I'm a scientist, therefore I believe this, or I'm from the community, therefore I believe that, we think that identity is a very important factor in risk disputes, and we would really like to go in and dig some more around that. Uh, and if you can break down um, the view that because I'm this person, um, I will automatically be opposed to that person, if you can break that down through dialogue, we think you can get um, some more movement in, in these risk disputes. Uh, we think you can open up those debates and you can find common ground. Um, we have confidence that dialogue can be a better way of going than the standard dispute in the public domain. Doing it early is really important, not waiting until the risk has gone through um, that classic life cycle when it's become almost impossible to get people even to speak to each other uh, or they're busy doing big strategies and game plan. And we think these approaches are applicable to other risk disputes. 
So uh, just some evidence of where we got breakthrough moments. Uh, we had a very short uh, intervention here. It was um, uh, an applied exercise, an applied experiment. But we did get some very interesting breakthrough moments. And these are words from our participants. So in that first bundle, people knew that there's adversarial debate. Um, they know that there are influences from the media. People get very um, uh, passionate about their own point of view. In that middle segment, they were really interested in what happened when they came into a dialogue experience. It was really interesting to hear and listen to other people and why their personal uh, stories and experiences were influencing their values. Um, thoughts opened up. And then when they reflected on the combined results, they were saying, well, I actually found that I had common ground with others and I didn't expect I would. They were really keen to hear what those other people were saying and why. Um, there was a very strong thread that came out a couple of times, well, of course the community would think that because they're not informed about science. It's a very standard thing that we've noticed in these debates. And when we explained that most of the people that we'd interviewed in that community interest group were actually quite well educated, not all, uh, a number of them had degrees, and a number of them had science degrees, uh, then that particular stereotype got busted quite firmly at that moment. So I'll come back to this idea about information and viewpoints later on. Um, and people were realising that values and emotions are important to this whole space. We do need more dialogue. There was a really strong view that the CRI should be engaging better and bringing the community into the process. Okay, so just to sum up, we want to say, what does this mean? You know, this is a qualitative piece of work, it's focused in, in depth, we've tried to pull apart why people say what they say, um, and how does that fit with the literature. So we're pulling out of this some big themes here. Um, we think that there are some very important things to take into account in investment in future foods. The notion of provenance is very important. Where did this come from? What was the intention behind this? What is the backstory? Are these people genuine in the way they're producing this food? People are not simply interested in the product, they're interested in the process behind it. Is it an authentic claim? Is it a valid claim? Are we being schmoozed by calling something natural when it's not? Um, that's very important in terms of the uh, resilience and the trust uh, that a market or a community may have. Consumer choice and benefits to society are also quite significant uh, factors that come through. And in the, amongst our New Zealand components, these technologies and these investments have to have benefit for New Zealand. It has to be marketable. So out of that, uh, we have identified what we're calling either stigma values or halo values that seem to attach to different types of technology. So the stigma values, if they become attached, I think they're quite hard to unattach or detach. So if, if something becomes seen as unnatural, that you don't feel that you trust the story or the product or the reassurances. There are clear ethical dimensions. Or you're saying, what is the point? Who is this for? Is it actually necessary or could we do something else? Those kind of stigma values um, are going to be difficult uh, for a technology or a particular food technology to be successful in the marketplace. On the other hand, halo values, um, safety, naturalness, healthy and so on, are going to add. Uh, and in our discussion uh, with Zespri, for example, and I'm sure I'm not breaking confidence by saying that, um, I mean, they have a fruit, <laughs> and they're not simply selling the fruit. They're selling the meanings and the values around the fruit. So it's almost like they get a double win <laughs> out, of this, out of the fact that they've got those halo values associated with the kiwi fruit. So uh, I think we've got some very important challenges here in terms of marketing theory, and the intersection between social research and marketing theory. And this is something that Ginny is pursuing. Um, we're talking with our colleagues in Plant and Food about and some of the marketing theory people at Waikato University. We think it's really important to think through what it is we measure in markets and how we uh, assign attributes and really what do those markets say? How do they read it when we present it to them? So those technology attributes um, that are likely to uh, be more successful, our summary from the work we've done uh, and our reading of the literature is as follows. Um, sustainability outcomes will help. That can be um, an attribute that's related to the technology. People tend to be more accepting of a technology where it looks like there's not a lot of massive intervention or impact or modification. Uh, not something that should be purely natural, but there tends to be more acceptance if there is not so much perceived modification. 
nutrition and health and safety is key. Uh, technologies that are um, on or around food look like they're going to create more acceptance than an intervention in the food itself. So that raises the question, how do we add value? Do we add value by changing the components or recognising attributes, processing, marketing, branding, halo values? What are the different ways, hard and soft technologies, where we can add value to our food? Um, and, and we think some of these technologies are actually about systemic intervention. They're about management systems. Um, for example, um, monitoring technologies or on-farm biodiversity. Those are, those are softer technologies, soft systems uh, technologies um, that can add value. And as one of our respondents said, you know, which we think sums up a lot of the New Zealand results and the international results, don't tinker with the food unless you have to. Think about those alternatives. So that's our um, high-level summary of what we think is coming through in this particular piece of work. So if we think about the implications, um, we've got um, a really important challenge to New Zealand to up our economic growth uh, through exports and work the biological sector as hard as we can to get those results. What does this kind of research suggest? Um, I'm going to um, put a proposition on the table here, and I'd be really interested at the end to hear what you say about it. Um, I'm suggesting that our focus, if you like, the dominant narrative when we think about um, our biological sector and our food sector, we have this idea of New Zealand at the bottom of the world shipping our stuff out. We make it and we ship it out, and we look for where to send it. But it's going from us out to there. And we just think the more we increase it going out, we've got a volume approach, a production approach, sending it out. My suggestion is that we need to also ship back in market and social intelligence. We need to close that loop. We have to understand what is happening in those markets. And our proposition to you today is that if we simply measure it with some of the more conventional measures, we're going to miss the full of what's happening in those markets. So we would like to see more social science and more innovative marketing theory coming together, and we would like to work much more closely uh, with colleagues uh, in Europe and, and um, Australia and, and in North America, but especially in Asia, which for some reason is not on that map that I picked up a few images. Maybe that's the statement, it's the missing zone that we should be focusing on. But we want to work to understand the drivers in those markets, and how those markets are responding in the context of social change there. Uh, and I'll come back and say something more about that in a minute. So what do we know already about Europe? This is where Lynn Freer was a great asset in our project, uh, and she has presented at some of our conferences. She's given us a snapshot of some of the very many studies that they've done uh, in Europe um, for countries as such as I've listed there. Um, and this is an overview. She's looked at all of the literature, a meta-analysis of all the literature around the world, um, and this includes the European ones, uh, about introductions to uh, food, new food technologies. Uh, and what are the themes? We can see the kind of technologies there, GM, pesticides, nanocloning, genomics, and the RFID technologies. So if we look at all the studies that have been done in a meta-analysis, what has been talked about in the literature? So she's actually done a landscape, as it were, everything that's been published. And there are, I have to stand here because of the angle, the big topic areas are citizen knowledge, perceived benefits, trust, and perceived risk. So those are the big themes in the literature internationally. So our study is certainly very consistent with that and the themes that we've identified. Then this question, people say, well, if we give people more information, is that going to change attitudes? And, and Lynn and her colleagues have done that because they are quantitative psychologists. Um, they have gone in and tested that proposition because it's the classic thing that people say. Um, if you tell people about the benefits, are they going to have more uh, positive attitudes to the proposal? And from their research, um, the answer is don't bank on that. It is more likely that a negative attitude will become slightly less negative um, and a positive attitude might become slightly less positive, but the underlying view is there. And so as Jenny said at the beginning, there's some very deep-rooted value propositions and framings. There's a cluster of quite strongly constructed values that then manifest, and when we measure it, either as a, a shopper or a member of society or a phone survey about perceptions. So they're quite well-structured value sets that are there. It, it's not simply going to be budged by better marketing campaigns about that. 
Now, looking at those three poor European countries, when people were asked about their attitudes to different uh, types of agri-production, you can see along the bottom, conventional agriculture, nanotech, organic and GM, you can see the pattern. Uh, not inconsistent with our own findings. So those um, are strong and um, established attitudes there uh, in that pattern. If you add information about benefits, what happens? Um, not a great deal changes. So I think we do need to move past our discourses amongst ourselves about if only we provided more information, people will shape up their ideas. It's not that simple. We have got to be more uh, exploratory about why people are saying what they're saying, how we can reconcile that, and we, how we use that as social intelligence. So let's just go through a quick overview of what we've seen from the literature and from some of the personal contacts that we have during the four years of this project. This includes meetings uh, in China and in Japan, where we work with um, social science colleagues. Very interesting meeting with New Zealand officials at the New Zealand Embassy in Beijing, uh, and working with international marketing experts, for example, Julian Valentin uh, from New Nutrition Business. So uh, a big trend that's become apparent uh, is this segment of the market called low hearts. Has anyone heard that term before? Lifestyles, lifestyles of health and sustainability. Starting to come through, um, this is 2000, uh, marketing people looking for trends, flagging this as a new segment. Uh, we know that the Loha market internationally is growing, uh, and uh, this idea of the green marketplace, freshness, naturalness, environmental benefits um, were starting to come through, and Loha consumers were being identified, concerned about the planet as well as their own health, um, price important, but being factored into other issues um, and uh, green consumerism. Consumers demanding that manufacturers design those low-ha attributes into their products. If we focus in on China, what do we know about what's happening in China? Um, the uh, obvious thing is the massive growth in income, although there's a little bit of tailing out of that at the moment. Uh, innovation amongst young people for new products. Healthy and environmental issues becoming important massive concerns about food safety, authenticity, provenance, for very good reasons, as you would know. Um, this study is saying that the Chinese are more concerned about environmental issues than the Europeans. And that fits uh, with what Julia Valentin and others have been saying. That if we look at the concerns of a middle class consumer in Shanghai, at least or even more concerned is that same middle class consumer in Amsterdam. We've got to be aware of that and understand that social trend, I think, better in New Zealand. So there are implications for future food investment in New Zealand. Uh, we don't have the whole picture here, but we're confident that what we've found with this triangulated study is giving us important signals, and we think it needs to be explored more. Uh, the benefits have to be there. Uh, medical um, uses uh, and functional foods um, are important uh, areas that can be developed across those science domains we were talking about. But we have to factor in those underlying attitudes, those values and those risk perceptions because they are influential. Uh, we would like to explore more what those mechanisms are for how that influence happens that needs to be tested more. Um, we looked at New Zealand markets. Uh, New Zealand markets matter. We are making this food here. It's part of us and our community, the kind of food we make and grow. But obviously international markets are important uh, and I think those know how factors need to be explored. So the market opportunities, um, Ginny's pulled this out in, in terms of two clusters. Um, a sort of segmentation of perhaps in the lower income area, um, price responsiveness um, is really key uh, and that might be a factor for mass market consumption. But then if we're talking about high tech products which are inherently about a better Person who's got a better salary, better income, that concern about health and so on, um, that is the high tech specialty markets, um, functional foods that deliver benefits, um, that's that other segment. But we know that in that high income uh, market where there's a concern about health, um, those are precisely the same people who will continue to present uh, that aversion around some technologies, for example GM, and continue to be very concerned about food and so on. So we might just quickly go back and triangulate and when we say what should we invest in in New Zealand, uh, we asked our people about that. Where should we be heading our investment? That was our strategy question. Um, and I might just get Janita to quickly capture some of the thoughts that were there. Yeah. 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 Y
rice for is very fast because I want to leave this good one for discussion. But um, yeah, this one can go. Yeah, I think all we're feeling that ethics of doing no harm are important, and we've got that low harm trend in there as well. Um, GM has its place, but be careful. New Zealand is clever and smart, but there was, I think, that reoccurring issue around un unanticipated or unintended consequences around what we're doing being um, key. The gold kiwi fruit um, issue was um, happening at the time we were doing these interviews, so that was drawn in as an example by a few people. Um, this is where we're looking at sort of words. Um, GE, not such a good use of words, and Men, I people think it's small, is it okay? Um, but we were sort of we were sort of of the view, and this was talked about in the workshops too. It's not just about the use of words. It's not something that word games is going to easily resolve because these are sitting on those very deeply held interlocking views. There. Um, Brand New Zealand, that surfaced all the way through as being absolutely important across all our stakeholder groups. Um, even though many of them pointed out that yes, it is a bit of a myth, but it's a myth that we stand on quite heavily and rely upon in a number of sectors for trading and for attracting people to our country. So really be careful that whatever we do doesn't compromise that. Um, and again, just around the food, and I think Karen's mentioned that about ingesting food and different you know, continuums of it depends. Mm -hmm. That was an industry for Yeah, yeah. And then sort of debating, yeah, what are the issues for New Zealand and looking at external markets versus looking after our own internal um, food security and, and distribution issues. Um, some dilemmas there. Um, yeah, so I think I won't say any more about that. But we have another time sheet with you when it's over. So I'll go through the rest of this Yeah. Okay, so I'm um, just going to come back to the storyline. Uh, we've taken you through, um, I've got a laser on the end of my thing here. <laughs> we've taken you through the current situation, what we know from the literature, our field work, the attributes, and reporting back, which is what we're doing here today. Thank you for being here. And the next phase will be to say, where do we take this intelligence in terms of strategy making uh, into particular end user groups, plant and food and zest group. Uh, and we hope that out of this will come some new insights on the social and market context which we think is part of organisational learning uh, and part of improving our investment model uh, for future food technologies. So this raises some questions about what we're paying attention to. Um, are we simply looking at growing our food, um, adding um, more knowledge and shipping out more um, products, or are we also looking about who are the people who are going to use it? And this project began when some scientists in plant and food said, there's no point in us doing this if nobody wants it. And I thought that was a magic moment. That's how this whole project came about. And I think that's our point here today. We have to join that circle between what we're doing with our science and food production and who the people are who are consuming. They are real people with values and lives and family histories. Um, they are the end users of our work. So this to me raises some questions about our notions of bio-innovation. Um, and I just want to spend a couple of minutes looking at this um, as um, a point of discussion. Uh, we could either take um, a product push approach or a market pull. And I'll just go through each one. If we take a product push idea, we focus on what we're doing, get really good at what we're doing. Um, and we, we focus very much down on where we are and what we're about. Uh, we, we invoke science and technology as the drivers of innovation. We focus on the process. And in a way, we get a productionist approach to science. We get things that are made to be shipped out, if you like, a widget approach to science. And if we run into resistance, we have to convince the user that they need the product. So that tends to make the innovation process very productionist, uh, a conveyor belt approach. We're shipping it out. And we make our science and we transfer it to end users. So it's coming from here and going out to there. It's linear. If we took a market pool approach, we would focus on that operating environment. What's the context of the work we're doing? What is the socio-political and economic and market context for this? What are the drivers? What's causing change or demand or reactions in markets? What are the outcomes that our science might produce? Where do social values have a role in the kind of impacts we get and in the kind of choices we make in our investment? Um, is it actually a matter of convincing users they need the product, 
or convincing product designers they need to meet the needs of users. That's flipping it around. What might we do for different forms of technology design? Can we think about a process of technology production that is collaborative, that uses more upstream engagement methods earlier in the design process? And we think about not simply transferring technology out, but what happens in the receiving environment? How is it taken up? How is it used? How is it diffused? <coughs> so uh, I think these are bigger questions around innovation and strategy that have emerged from our study, and we think are worth more discussion. Um, I'd also like to say I don't think it's either or. <laughs> because a lot of scientists have said to us, well, I can't just sit here waiting to find out what society wants before I even you know, pick up my pen or start working in my lab every morning. I've got to get on with it. I've got to be a leader. And other people are saying, well, you shouldn't be doing that because that's not what people want. So I think we need to have a dynamic between these two. Uh, and it really raises questions about the mechanism we've got for innovation. So if we go back to this original model, um, if we simply rely on the model, money gets put into the system, work gets done, products trickle out the bottom and find their way into the receiving environment, that's that conveyor belt approach to innovation. The red, circle, the red arrow at the top of the circle is key. How do we feed contextual information back into those decisions and what level? How do we close that between the design and the context? So I think that that leaves um, a number of research questions and I'm going to try and wrap up very quickly. We think uh, there are questions to do with global context and the New Zealand context. Um, we think more needs to be known about these things. The influence of social values on consumer markets. We've, we've identified, and this is Ginny's area of interest and expertise in particular, um, are we thinking of people simply as consumers, where they have a consumer hat on and we, we regard them as only having a consumer identity, or are, are they also citizens? We think they're both. What's the interplay between them, and how is that changing? What trends should we be aware of in those key markets? When we make a brand called Brand New Zealand, what is it that we think we are saying about ourselves? How do we construct that brand? What do we associate it with it? But then, how is that brand received? What does it mean by the receiving audience? What values are they taking out of it? Uh, and what do we know about that? How is it changing? And then how can, if we get that better intelligence from those contextual markets, um, how can that be gathered in and fed back into investment and policy decisions here in New Zealand? Moving to the New Zealand context, if we got that social market intelligence, if we got that flow working well, what would we do with it? How would that information be transferred and taken up by decision makers? What can we learn from some of these other technology disputes about the introduction of novel technologies and do better and perhaps less costly in terms of public debate? Um, this idea about information and risk perceptions, we know something of that from Lynn's work, but we need to explore more what those are, because that's an issue that people are concerned about. The use of dialogue. As you can see, we think dialogue has got a really important role to play instead of having a very intense risk contribution. Can it be used earlier on to reduce or avoid conflicts? How do we make strategy? What are we doing in companies and in CRIs and in other organisations to read the operating context? How is strategy being made? How is strategy being refined? How reflective and responsive is it? Those are some of the questions that we think have come out of our study and out of the workshops that we've had with people. So we are going to allow some time now. We, I think we started a little after um, the start time. So in fact, the alarm clock doesn't need to go off because we're, we're in a reason out of time. So I'm just going to hand over to Ginny now to um, uh, have a session with you where we can book your questions on the time. I guess I just put some, um, yeah, some sort of questions up there, we, but you might have some other questions as well. But particularly, I mean, I think what we were interested in were whether any surprises in that research for you, and then, you know, what are the implications in for the work that you do, particularly? You sort of imply that the values are fixed. I wouldn't agree with that. I think they will change. See them up So mm. that's part of the Some of these things will change if you come up with them. Yeah. I think we'd like to test that out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a very, it's a very good question to ask. Um, I mean, there's some trends. I think where we were saying that um, for the for example, um, that young men, particularly, 
in league who are quite early adopters and are quite keen on things like this. So I think there's different patterns that perhaps hold in different segments of society. Yeah. But just take it from point because I've just been yeah. about homosexuality and decades and uh, yeah, that was yeah. seen as unnatural and unnatural. Yeah. That's changed quite significantly. Yeah. Quite rapidly. yeah. It's for a range of other factors. And I think yeah. some of these technologies we've been seeing in Europe through the NTGMs, yeah. not as common as the well. So these things can have all the time. Yeah. So the market is going to be seen as a gap there as well. Yes, yeah. Yeah. We need to be reading the market more thoroughly and yeah. more robust kind of uh, antennae. Mm. Well, what causes that change? Like there used to be a lot of resistance to pasteurisation of milk, um, and now people expect it. Um, so what, because of the time being closed, um, but what, what causes that change in, in perception? That's a great idea. Yeah. I think if you um, if we look at the classic risk perception literature, um, and people's work about Paul Slover and so on, it all holds really true. So control, personal control, um, familiarity, trust, um, whether uh, people see that there's kind of a moral good coming out of it, um, whether they see social benefit, all of those classical things about any technology introduction um, do tend to track through with this um, uh, shift. So will that come over time if something's imposed on the community? Well, that, if it's imposed, then there's not a great sense of control. And so you get risk aversion arising um, when there's no sense of risk control, which is why the consumer choice and labour thing becomes so significant. Yeah. So it, it, it is a very complex field, um, but I think it does need to be explored more thoroughly for the reasons you're saying. Um, if the brand New Zealand is so important, and you've talked about um, authenticity and provenance, um, it seems to me that it's quite important that we don't sell the wrong thing with brand New Zealand. So, you know, um, the sort of tourism branding has been clean and green, but it seems to me that we should be thinking more about that brand New Zealand in terms of safety and in terms of food safety. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I, yeah, I think we can definitely be trying to Trust is quite complicated, um, and so you've got, if you like, the immediate foreground issues like the melamine scandal, uh, and so that's become a very dominant you know, motif really uh, in trust, and that's been a boost for the New Zealand brand in many respects by you know, unhappy accident. Um, but I think we need to dig into what are the you know, the underlying platforms that we are presenting, uh, the associations with our brand, but more importantly, what do the audience read? You know? So. Again, not just shipping out our idea of brand, mm -hmm. but knowing what is the receiving context in which the brand is received and acted upon, mm -hmm. what meaning is attached to that. Uh, so we need to close that loop on, on a brand as opposed to a product. Because mm -hmm. yeah. there's quite a bit of work being done in government on, on brand New Zealand. Yes, yes. That's one of the drivers mm -hmm. of the business growth it, it, it is. some of the actions in the business growth agenda. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm quite, I'm quite interested in what you say, because I think we don't understand that those drivers for how people perceive their brand oh, that's really right. well. Yeah. And we've flagged that as a question that needs more thought. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And I think working with colleagues um, who do similar kind of work to what we're talking about here, uh, mix of social science and critical marketing um, and science technology and society with people, um, people in China and other parts of Asia, and we need to join the dots so that we hear from them about what's happening with their people. Mm -hmm. Would you be surprised to learn that the um, rules about research consortia or partnership funding uh, prevent um, slicing up funding going to um, take on funding engagement? <laughs> um, current rules? Uh, I'm not sure they've changed in the last month or so. Right. Right. <laughs> that sounded like a parliamentary question, would you be surprised to know that? The
interesting moment. Interesting <laughs> moment. <laughs> we can talk more off yeah. 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 um, yeah. What was industry's um, response to the project? Do they get this, or are they simply saying, I'm just going to keep away from the risky stuff? There's no actual upside there for me. I'm not willing to push, use this stuff to push the boundaries. Or were they keen to get hold of it and say, okay, this opens up some more doors for them? Well, you tell about some of the interviews. You yeah. Know, you tell about some of the workshops. I think in the interviews there was certainly a feeling that the boundaries were being pushed regardless and that people were feeling that international partnerships were quite a good place to be pushing some of those boundaries. Um, there were some examples, for instance, around the packaging and processing where there's all kinds of different techniques that can be used and those technologies could potentially be located in other countries um, off season to sort of complement some of the things we're doing here. So it was all around thinking smarter and pushing the boundaries in different ways. That said, there were also some people in the industry who would not be pushing any boundaries at all in terms of bio and nano, given what they felt how they had read the markets and um, and I think there was a general feeling that functional foods may be an area where it may be fruitful to have more conversations about how some of those boundaries could be pushed whether in a domestic market niche setting or an external external market. So yeah. I think the yeah, across the board from the interviews and the workshops and our follow-up, because we did a number of briefing seminars and we did a big whole sort of country seminar in June, in the country, um, there is a, a very strong level of interest from industry in this and they're thinking, well, what does that mean about how we think about our marketing, um, how we make strategy, um, how do we involve stakeholders and how do we use that intelligence about stakeholders in our strategic decisions. Um, they're looking for ways of doing it, tools for doing it. It doesn't mean you have to go and consult every New Zealander before you do something. You don't have to do it that way. Um, and they were saying there's, you know, the, the side, there's no point in making it if nobody wants it. So it was like industry was the clearest about that. Mm -hmm. And that came through in our discussions with colleagues in Japan. Uh, we, had a, we had a really interesting workshop people in Japan and Taiwan and two or three other countries in Tokyo um, two or three years ago. And what we were hearing from our social science colleagues there was industry desperately wants to know about what these social values are so they can factor it in. Um, people like Julian Lamenton, who works with companies all around the world, were saying, well, the standard marketing tool is not enough. He said boardrooms all around the world are not getting enough robust information, enough nuanced information from standard, say, consumer surveys. They want a richer picture. They want to be a bit more predictive. Um, so we think there's a fantastic space there to enhance that sort of strategic reading of context and to um, develop some of the tools that we can um, try out here. Mm. Okay, I was going to say, um, you may already be aware, but like there's potential sources for information and trade and enterprise have got access to lots and lots of marketing databases mm. that look at food and a whole raft of other things. So if you're not tapping into them like already, then they are potentially like a, a challenge to go and tap into. Yeah. Plus also they're overseas, like in-country people. Yes. Might be able to go and give you feedback like on what's actually happening like in terms like of um, individual demand, plus maybe things like say food labeling or regulation changes yeah. or perceived changes. I think you're absolutely right. There is that data there. Um, the meeting has been automatically extended. Ooh, okay. <laughs> Good, thank you. <laughs> I think we should take this <laughs> last one. Um, our, our question is, well, what is used for that data? It's like production of data everywhere. Yeah. Who gets it? Who reads it? Is it, is it actionable? Yeah. Is it part of the way people practice their decision making? So we want to close that loop, um, getting the right data, but also how does that actually get taken up and used and influence decision making? Well, um, yeah, I, I, it has occurred to me that we could get led badly astray by taking too much notice of what people in New Zealand think about these things. Um, I had occasion to trawl through the um, university research reports um, recently. I was looking at the sort of research, uh, PhD topics that international students, and I found a number of them were clearly students from China and India who were producing information about their markets. And I just wonder if anybody's reading their theses. Yeah. Yeah. So using that intelligence. Um, I think probably not, to be honest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, the thing is, yeah, there's this huge silo 
thing happening in New Zealand. I mean, academia publishes so much knowledge. Um, it's not being utilized by you know, industry. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who in the boardroom reads like papers published by journals of knowledge? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that, that whole linking knowing about the market is very important. But I think your collaborative kind of approach is probably the start of maybe a, a structural model that you know, New Zealand needs to seriously look at because um, I know currently um, a work with Connor, I think she said. Yeah, she's starting this community science communications workshop which um, scientists pitch to entrepreneurs um, and there'll be one in the, in the next few weeks where entrepreneurs pitch to scientists and start the discussions at the start of the research, in the middle of the research and at the end um, and working together. And I think bringing like, um, academia on board is very important. And so people actually have a know what they're doing, how they're contributing to like a common cause. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm coming at, coming from a kind of New Zealand export perspective where we should be increasing the value of our exports. And it's a domestic market. In terms of the domestic market, I think it's quite hard to come from. Yeah, there's some things we can't really do. Mm -hmm. I guess what we'd say is that if we just had science talking to industry and industry talking to science, it's a bit self-referential. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we look talk with some of our other stakeholders we said, okay, well, where's the context in, in here? You know, so are scientists simply relying on industry to read the context? Uh, we think scientists should be reading context as well. Industry should be reading context. And we would humbly suggest that some social scientists can help interpret context and how you get that back in. So uh, I think we need to open up those conversations about who's reading the environment and how those decisions are made. In the discussion over coffee, most interesting, and I think so. Anyway, mm -hmm. I think that this a few things raised. You know that who we listen to is it? Uh, and if it was to both the overseas market coming at us, and what we're allowed to do in New Zealand with us, both important, mm -hmm. but it does add extra complexity to the whole picture. Mm -hmm. So thank you both very much, and uh, I just like everybody to enjoy. Thank you.